We are recording the interview of James Anderson. This interview is being conducted by David Morse from the Wright State University Veteran Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at the Crown Plaza in Dayton, Ohio. It is 9.44 a.m. on uh, July 12, 2019. All right, James. Okay. Uh, let's start off with when and where you were born. I was born in Hart, Michigan on May 23rd, 1948. Okay. And uh, who are your parents? Uh, James V. and Geneva Reed Anderson. But they were both originally from Kentucky. All right. All right. And what were their occupations? My father worked in a factory and so did my mother. Oh, okay. My father actually was a tobacco farmer before the war started, World War II. He got back from the war. He did one crop, then he wanted to get away from it and moved to Michigan to get a job in the factory. But since he lost an eye, he couldn't get one, so he came back to my mother's family. Was it? We've been in Indiana ever since. Oh, okay. So he, he was a World War II vet, you said? Right, he was wounded twice. Wow. Lost an eye. Oh, wow. And what uh, what branch was he in? In the, in, in the Army. In the Army? Um, he was drafted. Okay, okay. Yeah. Wow. He was actually older, about 24, I think, when they drafted him. Really? He was maybe a little older than that, born in 1920. Um, so then, what did you do before you joined the service? Went to high school. No, I went to a diesel engine school for a while after, after high school, but my parents couldn't really afford it, so I just came back to, went to work. And that's what we drafted. My dad convinced me not to let him draft me because I'd be an infantry like he was, so I joined the Air Force. So it was good advice. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's, that's really good. Yeah. Um, so he, uh, so he was obviously a major influence into Absolutely. the direction right. you went. Yeah. Great man. I've never been anything near like he was. That's good. Um, okay, so uh, when was this, roughly what year did you join the uh, Air Force? 1967. Okay. Oh, wow. All right. So uh, Vietnam was hot and heavy at that point. Yes, it was. And the reason I joined, a friend of mine came back, he'd been wounded and said, you listen to your father, don't let him draft you. I didn't want to go at all. I was going to fight it tooth and nail. So I went to college for a while, but I wasn't, my heart wasn't in it then. So I dropped out. My parents couldn't really afford it anyway. So I joined, I got deferred, deferred enlistment program. I was working at a gas station then because I wanted to be a mechanic. And this little recruiter, staff sergeant recruiter goes, uh, I guarantee you'll be a mechanic. I don't know what kind. So I said, okay, I'll sign up. I mean, that's the summer off. And I went in and I liked it. I liked what I did. I did have to go to Vietnam a couple of times, but not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, well, let's, let's talk about um, basic then. How basic was training? Yeah, how was basic training? I said, I don't think it was too bad. I was kind of worried about it because I wasn't physical, but it wasn't bad. I remember at the end, you had to do certain tests, physical tests. I had a hard time with push-ups. I had to do so many push-ups a lot of time. And I think the, the DI knew I couldn't finish it right. And I was really struggling. He looked away and he went, stand up. So I said, oh, I had done it and he let it go. So I had still been in basic training today, probably. <laughs> That's funny. And they sent me to school. I had three choices for, for the job at basic. They were mechanical jobs, just like the recruiter promised. Hydraulics, propellers, uh, munitions. And I was no way I went munitions, that's dangerous stuff. So I said, propellers, that's pretty good. How hard can that be? It's a prop on front of an engine. And I was so naive back then, I thought reversing meant the engine went backwards. But I learned later on that it wasn't so. I liked the job. Um, so I, that's why I stayed, probably. Yeah. That's funny, I went munitions. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I was a, I was a loader in, really? in maintenance. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I yeah. did a lot of a lot of maintenance on aircraft. Uh, F-16s. I didn't want to play with bombs. I watched too many movies. I guess so they exploded. <laughs> it wasn't for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, basic training. Uh, how, how long was that roughly? Uh, six weeks for us. So they're getting the guys through pretty fast. And then from there, I went to tech school in Wichita Falls, Texas. They got snows up there for propeller training. And I really enjoyed it. The instructor said, you, you'll probably be, do all right. This, I see you like this stuff. I said, I'll, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. A little more complicated than the car. And you know, I'll do pretty good. So you were kind of a natural? That's kind of what he said, yeah. OK. Once I understood what was going on. Right, yeah. right. All right. And, and how long was uh, tech school? Uh, I think it was 17 weeks. I got 
I got there in October, I got done in February, and in February they sent me from there to Seward Air Force Base, Tennessee, which was the 314th Tactical Air Force Wing was there then, for training on the C-130E model propeller, I think it was 54, 860, that's 91, I still remember that. And then, then from there I got to go on leave for another couple of weeks, and they sent me to CCK Air Base, Taiwan. That's wow. why we're here this year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, <clears throat> So it wasn't long before you uh, you were shipped overseas. What uh, what did your family think? Uh, well, of my the dad thought I was going to Taiwan, so my dad thought that was okay. That my mother wasn't too thrilled about me leaving at that time, but they sent me to Taiwan. I remember it was raining. They got there April 17, 67. It rained on July 4th, 67. Then I was in training. You got, you got upgrade training from three level to five level. They call it. That took me to almost November. Once I got that completed, I could work on my own on the aircraft. They sent me to Vietnam then. Uh, I got my train was upgraded. Okay. So and I went to Tui Wai Air Base the first time. And I, I really enjoyed that. With the, not a lot of scary stuff going on there. We just did a lot of work busy. Um, okay. Uh, so, all right. So you're uh, walking me through this a little bit. Uh, yeah. So you went to CCK right. and you went from your uh, four level to five level. Yeah, they call it three level to five three level. Three level. It's all odd numbers in the military. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So three level to five level. Right. And from CCK, you then went to Vietnam. Right. Where I could work on my own then. I see. And I worked on propellers and engines with the people there. Okay. I stayed there until probably February. Then I went back to CCK. Then went to TDY again to Cameron Bay and Bangkok, Thailand. Then in July '69, my time was up there, and they sent me to Naha, Okinawa. So there's the same thing, different airplanes with the same rotation was going on. Oh wow, uh, okay, okay. So these were these were TDYs essentially yeah, that yeah. you were doing. Yeah. I was never assigned PCS to Vietnam ever. Mm -hmm. I'm always TDY. Oh, okay. And one time I got all my vouchers together and about eighteen months I spent in Vietnam total. Vietnam and Thailand. Wow. Okay, so let's talk about <clears throat> Let's talk about CCK a little bit. Okay. What, what was your first impressions of CCK? I was kind of, I kind of liked the thing. It was quiet, peaceful, people were friendly. I, I liked it. It was a beautiful place. I said, well, this is really nice. You know? yeah. First days of freedom, and you learn a lot about life there. You know? Young women teach you. <laughs> but I liked it. The food was good. You know, and, and they taught, taught us good, treated us good. We had houseboys in the berries, so we just was in the chow hall. We lived, were living like kings. I liked it. And how long were uh, your typical shift hours? Twelve. Twelve hours. Most of the time. A lot of times we worked eight hours, but then as people rotate, go to twelve. So it's just a, we worked twelve hours, shifts half the year, eight hours the other half, as rotations took place. In Vietnam, we worked twelve hours seven days a week. But every now and then we got a day off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, what did you, uh, when you started going TDY, um, uh, specifically, let, let's talk about Vietnam for instance, okay. where, where did you end up in Vietnam again? The first place I went was Tui Wai. Okay, and where, where is that at? Oh, uh, that's close to Chu Lai, it's in Central Highlands. It's on, along the beach. Okay, and, and how was that? That was a nice assignment. Had the beach there, and we, and we just walked to work and stuff. It was, it was just a nice, nice place. We worked twelve-hour shifts. We walked to work, worked outside, like that. Did, did you, uh, while you were there, did you see much conflicts happening well, around you? Well, we got, well, yeah, a couple of times. We were working one day, and it was, it was night time, and I was up inside of Willwell. I come down, turn around, see this body is black pajama guy, I could hear that window from me. And I knew right then my life was over. I looked and I started running, turned around, he was going the other way just as fast as he could. That was my problem. I was really scared then, really scared me to death. I said, wow. And I tripped around and tried to get to the bunker, get my leg up, and then that was over. Then another time, of course, they were throwing mortars in on us for a little while. I don't know if it, while I was there, they brought sasser charges in and caught an airplane on fire and we had this bump sergeant went out and he started the engine to attach the aircraft away from the fire. And our captain wanted the court marshaling for not having a taxi license. But of course when he got back to CCK, the captain, the colonel pretty well stopped all that and stuff. Yeah. 
So I started giving him a silver star or something. I don't know how it ended up. The guy that was going to reenlist and he didn't. He got out because of that. Wow. I call that petty crap, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I won't forget that. That's just interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. My life was pretty well in the military. It was just like a regular job. You know? Went to work, went home. Nothing really outstanding out of the ordinary. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, you did Vietnam, uh, and then you said you you did a couple <clears throat> a couple other uh, temporary duty assignments there. Yeah, the Cameron Bay, Vietnam, uh, Bangkok, Thailand, which is a very nice assignment. I was there for ninety days. That was great. Spent all my money downtown on beer hookers. I think but it was a good job. We were twelve hours a day there too. But it was nice. It was hot but nice. And from there, I went to, my time was up at CCK by then, July 69. They sent me to Naha, Okinawa, and I went to TDY on Naha. It was just the same places, but they also did the same job. From Naha, I went to Tan Sanu for the first time as a Saigon. That was a nice assignment. Mm. And it was pretty peaceful there, too. Now, <clears throat> I'm interested, so you had, your, your PCS was at, um, uh, either uh, CCK right. oh, that's or right. Okinawa. Right. Yeah. Not hard, those times. are my PCS assignments. But right. From there we went TDY. TDY. Yeah. What, was there any difference between the jobs that you did at your PCSs and your TDYs? No. Same job. Well, we did so we did engine buildup, propeller buildup at the CCK and Naha, and we just did a parts replacement in Vietnam. All the complicated work, like build it, put the engine together, like overhauling the engine. You don't overhaul it in the combat zone, so you overhaul it where it's safe. That's basically what CCK and Naha was doing. We did the basic routine work there and regular, just keep it flying work, TDY. I see. I see. So, <clears throat> the ones on TDY, um, I'm curious, were those ones that you've seen that come back that had a lot of battle damage to right. them? We, we flew some back gear down, that have been shot up. You get one of the aircraft all shot up, you put, we call it speed tape, aluminum tape all the aircraft, fly it back to home station and repair it there, then we bring the aircraft back. Yeah. Aircraft ro rotated just on a 15-day basis. And maintenance like us, we rotated on a 60-day basis. The air crews were there for two weeks and we were there for two months. Yeah. So our jobs were different. Was there at any point that you had to ground an aircraft to the engine not being able to be flyable? Oh yeah. They had to make that decision. And then, we, then you repair it and then you let it go again. Like grounded for, say, a propeller. The, the, they got what they call cuffs on. The cuff got broke for some reason or they got a bullet hole in it. Then you had to ground it until you change the prop put it back on. Mm -hmm. And how quick of a turnaround was expected in those types of circumstances? Oh, we could do one in eight hours usually. If a major, we could change an engine in eight hours or a propeller in two. It wouldn't take long. Oh. And <clears throat> We're saying we, so uh, I'm assuming you guys worked in crews? Yeah, there was, a, there was about 15 of us together, TDY, each from a different AFSC. That's a job, Air Force, so especially cold. I was propellers, was propeller guy, an engine guy, a hydraulic guy, electrician, avionics. For every, every, we're like a union shop, you know, I've worked propellers, you work engines, but we all work together as a unit to keep the airplane flying. Okay. You had a guy who did brakes, you had a guy who did tires, you had a guy who did, I did propellers, a guy who did inches, a guy who did radar, a guy who did radio. Yeah, we all had our own job. Right? Since you're there by yourself, you had to work with the other guys so you get the job done. We couldn't change, I can't change the prop by myself, I had to get help from somebody else. So, like an engine, it takes three guys to change an engine, so I helped the engine guy, and another guy did too. And then Tui well, he's an electrician, but he was a big guy, he would pick up the stuff pretty quickly. They all work together. It's like a team. I see. That's why Tui was my favorite memory because that was the best team I was with, I think. Because they put us there all at the same time and we all left the same time. Other teams that kept rotating people in and out every couple of weeks. They didn't really know anybody that well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, it makes it hard. Yeah, when you know, it's a pretty good deal. When you, when you know everybody you work together, it's much, much easier. Yeah, yes it is. Did you guys have TOs that you had to have right. open? Right, take down. Yeah. They can run inside the airplane. You went over to the museum over here to look at airplanes. They got a C-130 in there. If you look, when you get in the cockpit, the stairway, 
There's a little box there. The teals are kept in there. I did not know that. Yeah. yeah. That's I, what my girlfriend had yesterday when I was over there. I said, there, the books are right there. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, we, <clears throat> we always had to have the TOs open to the page well, that you were working that's on. That's the same. It was when I was in, too. But really? We always, we always just put them on the stand and set it there. Yeah, we had to, you're right. I forgot about that. We had to carry it with us all the time. Yeah. We just never opened them. They were there. Yeah, we kept them on the dispatch truck. Yeah, that's right. That still applied when I was there. Wow. <clears throat> I forgot about that. That's pretty good. <laughs> good memory. Yeah, well, I, I, I was, uh, I know somewhat of what you're talking about because the maintenance. And that the phase you were working on. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah. We did. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah, working with a team that, that you're comfortable with, you right. don't have to explain some of the, the, the basics of, of that stuff, um, how to work together and all that. That's right. That's really good. Okay, so how long um, were you at um, CCK all together? Okay, I was there twice. Okay. Uh, CCK 69 is 15 months, and 72, 73 was about the same, about 30 months, two and a half years maybe, okay. that's a CCK. I was at Naha, 18 months, I think. I got there in July 69 and left in April 71 when the base, see when the were leaving. That was in North Dakota. I didn't have much to do there. It's kind of boring. I just re enlisted, I was married then. And I volunteered to go back to CCK because that was a good assignment. Then when that ended, they took us to Kadena, and I had a Japanese wife, so I stayed there. Then we went to Japan. I stayed over there until 1983 before I went back to the States. Really? Yeah. That's <clears throat> it, was a, it was a nice life. My daughter was born over there. She's in her 40s now. <laughs> she was born in? Uh, Tokyo, Japan. To okay. <clears throat> now, uh, so you... <clears throat> In North Dakota, that was a Minot? That Minot. You ran. Yeah. They had a base T-29 recept with a, only one propeller aircraft up there. I helped them. I helped the helicopter guys see while I was there. My oldest daughter was born there. We took her to Taiwan with us in 73. And that's actually 72, actually. We left at 73. 72, 73, then they moved the C-130s out and went to Kadena. When you went back to right, right. right. Now, um, how was how was Kadena? I mean, it seems That's like a nice song. I liked it there. Yeah. And what was it about Kadena that you really liked? The weather. <laughs> we worked outside. Nice to have warm weather. And that's and the people were friendly. I just liked the atmosphere. It was nice. It's like one big military base anyway. I just liked it there. But I think the weather is a key point. Stay overseas. Yeah, yeah. That's that was nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so and and in Kadena, it was mostly C one thirties that you were working on. That's all I worked on. Yeah. Okay. They had F fours and one thirties, and we were we were not a major base. There we had our parts out of Clark, plus Clark go on the build up shop there. So we were just like a forward operating location, and they figured that wasn't. Working so well, they, so they sent us to the Cold Air Base Japan a couple of years later. I don't remember what year, maybe 75. Okay. And I stayed at Yakota until 83. Until 83. Yeah. All right. That was like working a regular job. Then the war was over, you worked eight hour shifts, five days a week, weekends off. Did a lot of vacation over there. Nice. That's very nice. Now, uh, <clears throat> you said you were in. Uh, you went back to CCK there at the tail end before yeah, they moved. 72, yeah. yeah, 72, before they moved them to Clark Air Force right. Base. Did you end up following the C 130s to Clark, or was that when no, you I moved went to back Kadena. to Kadena? They went two places. They went to Kadena and Clark. Mm -hmm. I, I chose Kadena. I see. Yeah, so, same thing, only I went to the other place. Most people went to Clark, but I went to Kadena. Okay. And, uh, what was the reason for going to Kadena? My mentioned? wife was Okinawa. Ah, yeah, that, that was a simple solution. <laughs> so <clears throat> let's uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the um, your second time going to CCK. How is that different than your first time? Well, my fam well, family was there, and I had a car. It was just like a civilian life there. It was. 
it's just the same job, but it was easier. I had transportation. Mm. I lived downtown. It was nice. Nice. It wasn't any harder. So, same style of job. Yeah. And uh, the convenience of a car, that <clears throat> that helped. Um, what, what was it like? As far as the living, the living quarters um, downtown. Well, we lived in an apartment. It's just like any apartment in the states. You know, we paid our rent, and had electricity and water, and it was just like living anywhere. That's nice. Parking for the car is hard because it's a little narrow alleyway, but it was all right. <laughs> That's good. All right, and uh, <clears throat> then I guess. After, uh, once you finally got back from, um, so I'm trying to get the timeline straight here. Um, your first assignment back home uh, to the Sorry. United States was Minot. Minot, right? North Dakota. Okay. I left there in 72 and went back to Taiwan. Right. Then in 73, I went to Kadena. Uh -huh. Then I. In about 75 or 76, I don't remember what year exactly. We went from Kadena to the Yokohama Air Base, Japan. I know I was there in 77 when my daughter was born, and I think it was 75. I'd say from 75 to 83. Then I went to Patrick Air Force Base, Florida. This was a pretty good assignment, but I got divorced by then because I had some problems going on. I was single parent in the North. I got from there, 85, I went to Germany. I stayed till 88 and I retired then. Okay. I had my whole career. Wow. Just a regular simple. Yeah. Nothing really exciting about my military career. Well, so let's let's talk about um, when you came back to uh, Minot. Um, what, I mean, we, how was the welcome home? Uh, I never had any problems at all. Uh, I flew into California. We went, we go, well, actually, I went to Hawaii, California. We flew to Chicago. My parents picked me up there. I never had anybody give me any trouble or anything at all. I've never seen any of that spitting stuff or That's good. baby killer. I was, I was pretty, I guess, lucky. Yeah. And were you happened. in uniform or civs? Well, I didn't wear my uniform, but you know, we were pretty obvious with a short haircut that we were no, there. Was nobody ever bothered me to say anything. That's good. So I didn't experience any of that. And that's probably why I stayed overseas. I didn't want to see it anyway. So, but I want to flew back home. I flew out of San Francisco. Nobody said anything. And was there uh, <clears throat> when you came back in, in eighty? Or would you say eighty three? Eighty three. I went to Florida. Went to Florida. Went to Florida. And in eighty three, was did you find that there was any real differences uh, between the first time you came home and the second time you came home? I didn't notice any change at all. So I'm kind of. A loner. I don't really go out anywhere. So I hang around. It's kind of quiet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that would be what part of it there, I guess. Didn't see anybody, so I don't talk to anybody. <laughs> uh, and so you said you retired out yes. there. Uh, what rank did you retire out? I retired E7. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Uh, and. After you retired, what did you end up doing? Uh, industrial maintenance. I got my degree in, while I was in, this is my, a story maybe, when I was in the military, I, I wanted to go to college, so I went to the University of Maryland in Japan and graduated with my degree in English. I graduated probably 82 or 83, somewhere in there, no, before then, before I left anyway, I got my degree in English. So when I retired, went back to my hometown, but I was a single parent. I thought I wanted to be a teacher. I want to teach English out here to high school. So I went and talked to my friend. His name was Hippo Steel. He's a superintendent. So I'd like to be a teacher. He goes, well, you've been gone a long time, military guy. Why don't you substitute for a while first? I said, OK. So I substitute, put me in the history or something, a subject I didn't know very well. But the kids were being a little unruly, so you guys sit down and shut up, get off your butt and sit down. And they called me to the office, you can't do that, you can't talk to the kids that way. So it did to me. And he goes, see, I told you you've been out too long. So I went back to industrial maintenance in the factory, it was better. But I got a lot of respect for teachers nowadays. Yeah. 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 But my 
my granddaughter's a teacher, and my nephew's a teacher. The best way to be a teacher is, is my, if I'm going to give advice to be a teacher, go to high school, go to college, start teaching right away. Then you know the slang and what's, all the changes, you go right along with them. And my granddaughter does a wonderful job at Franklin, Indiana. She's a coach, she teaches math to uh, children with disabilities. Really a good job. But she went that route. Yeah. And that hypnotist still was trying to tell me that, be kind to me at the same time. It's hard for someone who's been away from it to come back to it. No matter what you were doing, he was right. Wow. Good advice. Yeah, that is. It's yeah. really good. So I went to industrial maintenance and I went to Ivy Tech and got the electrical and industrial maintenance, industrial maintenance degrees paid for by the factory. So I used my GI Bill to get my English degree at the University of Maryland. And then I restored motor homes for a while and now I'm retired. That's great. That simple life. Yeah. 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 And uh, <clears throat> so through throughout all that, uh, what uh, I think here, yeah. how, uh, let's see. I guess. Hmm. I just had a routine career. <laughs> Nothing really. I don't want to put that. It was some tough times, but it wasn't. Nothing really caused me any real problems. About I did drink too much back then. Yeah. But that's a military habit. They teach you that right away. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but I got over that several years ago. So now that you're retired, um, have you been a part of any military? I, uh, I'm a, I belong to the American Legion, the VFW, and stuff, and I'm the finance officer, right? And I write books. Oh yeah, History you're a writer. Books, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. I've been published four times. Now. What books? What, what These books are, are books? history books about my small hometown. World War One, history of Lake Erie, Indiana, and now I'm doing World War Two. I got three volumes out. I'm just writing about the people, the town. I'm just I started not doing all the writing. I'm just taking it from the old newspapers and transcribing it. <laughs> and that's about it there. And what brought on that passion? I don't know. I well, one day uh, in 2012. I was at the American Legion in Lincoln here. I was still drinking at that time, but I was slowing down. But So the ladies, we got to get our Christmas decorations out of the shed outside. I said, okay, I'll get them for you. So we're never looking at all these old toasts. I think the place is a mess, like a hoarder's. You know how a hoarder's house is? You walk in, well, this is how this thing looked. I went in there. Full of toasts. I know on the floor was this old ledger book, about you know, those little thick ones you see from the 20s. Open up with the minutes of 1920 of that legion when it opened. So I took that, so, oh, I'm going to save this. So I went to that home to transcribe it, to save it. And I started seeing these guys' names who were in World War I. And I said, well, i got to find out who they are. And do that, I got to write the newspapers that back in World War I, 1917 to 1919, they wrote letters back to the city, and they published them all in the paper. So I started publishing those letters. And in World War II, the same thing. So that's where it started. Wow. And it's so interesting because now in World War II, I know some of these guys. And my best buddy in high school's dad was a POW in Poland. I didn't know that. So that's what we're, I'm doing. That's why that keeps me busy. That is incredible. Yeah. That's I give awesome. away some of the copy. I give Jim Dwyer, if you want to see what it looks like, Jim Dwyer's got a set. I give him a set. And I give a Keller a set to Bob Keller of those books. That's a gift for all the work they did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really, that's yeah. really awesome. Yeah, that's pretty out of trouble. <laughs> it's a whole new sober world out there. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, all right, so um, it's kind of wrapping things up here. Yeah, I don't have a lot of exciting stuff to talk about. <laughs> oh, no, that, I think, so part of our program is, a, is historical, just, you know, archiving this stuff and, and capturing stories, and I think, you know, at least that part is very important, yeah. um, and I think uh, every veteran's story is 
It's extremely important. So I lived in a small town back when I was in high school, at 2,000 people, and I think they got 4,000, I think 50% are Spanish because of the influx. And out of the paper, when I was doing World War II, I got 800 names of people that were involved in World War II. Not all of them were in the military, but they were involved somewhere or another. Right. I could, I'm, only, I'm only into the H's, so I have, I'm not even a third done with the names of these books. Wow. I'm already on the third volume. I did about 250 pages I stopped, but it's getting too thick. I self-published through a dicky pot out of this year. Hey, are you the only one transcribing this, or do you have some help doing this? Oh, I have my girlfriend now sleeping with that. She okay. does some research. We look, we look to see what happened to the families. I mean, there's a nurse in World War One. her name's Ethel Fisher. She's in France, she's probably 28, graduated high school in 1910. I always wonder what happened to her, because her letters tell us she's having a good time over there in France with the doctors and stuff. What happened to her? They never did find out. Oh, she probably, I figured she married that doctor and they stayed in France, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, that is really yeah. interesting. And my buddy's uncle, World War II, now we get to World War II, our little town, Lagan, Indiana, we had these two guys in a small town, Cromwell was next, so we had little small towns together in the newspaper. The guy's name's Maggart and Galloway. They're flying a B-17 out of England to bomb in France. And they get all the flak, you know, the flak. You see, you see the movies of flak. Yeah, they the flak. And lost an engine, they said, we're going to go back. So they turned around, went back, and they was able, to, by the time they got over the channel, they had one engine still running. And they landed that aircraft, crash landed it in Kent, England. And they all survived out of scratch on any of them. And another story, in Kobe, Japan, that out of a, ran into an island. This guy is a co-pilot, name's Mosher, my, my friend's uncle. They got shot down. My, the girl in my class's father was another airplane and see them all bail out. They all survived and they got executed over there. That's from the same small town. So, so World War II impacted everybody. Yeah. And that's yeah, why absolutely. that's why I kept at it, because I find out more and more information about people you never knew did this stuff. My my college my high school principal was awarded by Nimitz for that landing craft stuff he was doing. Got an award by Nimitz for that. Normandy Beach, driving the the Higgins boat, I guess you call it. Yeah. My principal we didn't know that either. <laughs> that's why I do it. That's, that is incredible. And one guy told me, if you don't do this, it's going to all be forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I do. Yeah. Kind of like what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so, um, yeah, wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, we could we could probably do a, an entire series just on that. Really. Well, I told you want to send a little books, I'll give you a set. Okay. Oh, that'd be great. Right. That'd be awesome. I'll do that. If you want to, i got to keep house on <laughs> Well, a uh, couple of last minute questions here. Okay. Uh, so, some of the characteristics that you learned, I mean, you had, it sounds like you had a very successful career, honestly. Yeah. Um, I had retired to and, I mean, just yeah. just an honest, successful career. Yeah. Um, I was lucky. What, what characteristics did you uh, pick up in your military career that you applied thereafter? Honesty and integrity. Honesty, be honest. I learned my father tried to teach that to me when I was kind of a little thief when I was young. Of course, he took care of that before I got any farther. But I learned it in the military, and I learned it from the military. Do the best you can, but never lie to anybody, no matter how much it hurts. You know, tell the truth always, and then you things will work for you. That's what I learned more from the military. Honesty, hard work, and integrity. Never give up. Yeah. Basically. That's all military trades. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. And then, uh, final question for you. Um, of course, this is going to be archived. Um, okay. Future generations uh, will have the opportunity to view this. Okay. Uh, what message would you like to leave for them? That's a hard question. <laughs> what would I leave for future generations? I guess uh, be true to yourself and don't be afraid to take a chance. I don't know. That's good. Yeah. Because it's hard. Sometimes it's very, very scary. Say, say you're in a room somewhere and that your friends are doing something that you know is really wrong. Be brave enough to say, "Hey, look, let's don't do that." When I was a young kid, I would have probably 
said, no, but I was in my, in my old yearbooks a while back. When I was a kid, I guess we had some trouble with some bullies when we were little. And my, my high school buddy in my yearbook goes, you're the only one who didn't run that day. We had some people that going to beat us up, but we stood up to them and they ran away from us. And don't be afraid to say, controversy. Like, like now that our, our religion is being challenged, if you're, say, you're a Christian, what would you do? Would you cower under and say, okay, I'll go with you? Or would you let them go ahead and take a chance at being shot? Now, when I was in high school, I might have cowered down, but today I just let you. The Jewish did that. I think they were right. Too bad our world's that way. Right. But don't be afraid of controversy and do what you think's right, no matter what the consequences. Sure. That's good. That's really good. That's what I think, anyway. Well, James, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate you sharing your story with me. Right here, and I'll.